On tonight's show, we're looking at the bigger picture. The latest home cinema projectors go head to head. And great gadget icons, past, present and future. To begin with, we're going to look at some gadgets that have stood the test of time and already achieved iconic status. So, here are our top 10 gadget icons. At number 10, the most modern gadget in the chart, Apple's iPod. It's dominated the digital music market from the moment it was launched. At number 9, it's the HP35 Scientific Calculator. Launched in 1972, it suddenly made maths homework a whole lot easier. Number 8 is the Nintendo Game Boy, designed in 1987 by a Japanese fella working for a playing cards manufacturer. This was the first handheld games console and an incredible 100 million have been sold. At 7, the Motorola Dynatac 8000 series, commonly known as the Brick Phone. By today's standards, of course, its vital statistics are laughable cost over £2,000. It weighed the best part of a kilogram, and to keep it on standby, you needed to charge it three times a day. But such is the human urge to communicate that by the end of the first year's production, over 300,000 people around the world were using phones like this. At number six, it's the DJ's turntable of choice, the Technics 1200. 90% of all clubs worldwide use them. In 1969, Technics introduced the direct drive turntable system. With the motor coupled directly to the platter on which the record turns, it boasted less vibration and more rotational stability. The technology reached its zenith in 1972 with the introduction of the Technics SL 1200. The inherent stability of the deck ushered in a new era of vinyl manipulation, otherwise known as scratching, and heralded the birth of hip-hop and the cult of the DJ. At number five, the Sinclair ZX Spectrum, or the Specky as it was affectionately known. It was an 8-bit home computer that meant you could finally play arcade games in your sitting room. And at number four, the Polaroid camera launched in the 40s. Its instant pictures caused a massive stir, and today more than 200 million have been sold. At any given time, 100 Polaroid pictures are developing in shaking hands all over the world. And so to our top three iconic gadgets from the past. And at number three, it's the mouse. This mouse comes from one of the first computers to be sold with one, Apple's Elisa, which hit the market in a blaze of unpopularity back in 1983. But the mouse was already 20 years old. It was actually invented by a chap called Engelbart, who spent a couple of years testing out every conceivable form of screen navigation. Oh, and by the way, he didn't call it a mouse, he called it a bug. Number two is the Sony Walkman. It revolutionised the way people listened to music. Before this, there was no such thing as a portable player. And the Walkman is also one of the few gadget brand names to make it into the dictionary. And so to our number one iconic gadget from the past. The average living room would be a very tedious place if you had to get up off the sofa every time you needed to change channel or turn up the volume. Thank goodness, then, for the remote control. The first remote controls of the 50s were connected to the television by a cable. Later came ultrasound and, in the 80s, infrared. Like all the best icons, it's changed our behaviour and turned us all into channel hoppers. Of course, the remote's been far too successful for its own good. Every sofa's a breeding ground for them. We've got five next to ours. Still, it's better than getting up. I've got six. This is the largest production plasma screen in the world. It's got a 71-inch screen, and complete with surround sound and a digital decoder, it'll set you back £40,000. Of course, you don't have to pay that much for a big picture, but even a 42-inch plasma producing a half-decent image means you'll be looking at the thick end of three grand. Now, even if you're determined to get a proper home cinema experience, it's difficult to justify that sort of money.
There is an answer though, a way to get an even bigger picture than the one available on the world's largest plasma, a picture which is arguably even better quality and has a price tag of less than a thousand pounds. I'm talking about home projectors. Home projectors have actually been around for a long time, but until recently, they used CRT technology. You've probably seen one nailed to the ceiling of your local. They use red, blue and green cathode ray tubes to produce three images that combine as they hit the screen. Just like in the world of normal tellies, good old CRT technology offers the best picture available in a projector. The blacks are truly black. They also produce the most film-like image you can get in your home. But there are a few major drawbacks. They're big and heavy, they don't cope well with daylight, and new ones cost over eight grand. So, unless you've got a very dark, very lucrative pub, I don't really think that this is a viable option. Luckily, there are two other choices that are way, way cheaper, LCD and DLP projectors. Unless you've got a very large, very flat, very white wall like this one, you'll have to get yourself a good screen, which will set you back about £200. But the cost of the entire setup will still cost less than half the price of a good plasma. An LCD projector basically works by passing a powerful light source through an LCD chip, a transparent one in here, and it's made up of individual pixels that are displaying the moving video image. That is then projected through the lens and onto your screen. What makes the LCD projector so practical is its compact size. They are also the cheapest, with some models available for under £500. But their main drawback is the way the pixels merge a number of tiny pictures into one large image. If all those tiny pictures get too big, then our eyes can't blend them. And look closely, it looks as though we're viewing the image through a mesh. DLP stands for Digital Light Processor and is a relatively new technology. As well as appearing in home projectors like this one, it's also being used more and more in movie theatres to replace the more traditional film projectors. The clever bit inside the projector is a very small processor which is covered in over a million tiny mirrors. These flick back and forwards thousands of times a second and when light is shone on them through a colour wheel, the movement creates tiny parts of the picture. Put all of those parts together and you get a very bright, very detailed image. So, two options, LCD and DLP, but which is the best? To find out, we've got the Gadget Show's very own odd couple, John and Jason, to come and have a look. Lights, please. They'll be watching identical DVD footage on Infocus's Screenplay 4805 DLP projector and Hitachi's PJTX100 LCD, both of which cost around £1,000. Neither John or Jason knows which picture is which. So, after 15 minutes watching both pictures, what do the boys think? So in terms of general clarity, which one mm. do you feel is clearer? There's a big difference uh, between the left-hand side and the right-hand image. Uh, the the left-hand one has just got a lot more contrast and it looks an awful lot clearer from where I'm sitting. I think the one on the left is sharper. It looks as if it's a, it's a more defined picture than the one on the right. I can't see the sorts of things that define a clear picture. I can't see that in the right hand side. Which one do you think is the DLP? I think the one on the left is the DLP. Jason? I think the one on the right is the DLP. What's the answer? The one on the right is the DLP. Ah. Did you expect more from the DLP? I expected the DLP to be perhaps less, less even, less technically perfect but more involving so that's why I probably went for the, for the left one as the DLP one. The reason I think I got the choice right is that I have an LCD projector and there's a, it's just really strange there's a certain quality to the image that I recognise. 
Earlier in the show, we revealed our top three iconic gadgets from the past. But could the next legend come from the present? We'll start with the latest handheld games consoles. And the first candidate is this, the Nintendo DS. Obviously, it comes from a long line of computer gaming consoles. It started with the Game Boy in 1988, so it has the makings of a true icon, a classic of its time. What's new about it? Well, the, the dual screens, as you can see, and the fact that the games are made for a, a dual screen environment makes it unique. It just feels plasticky, and I don't think, especially when you close the lid, I don't think it has anything particularly remarkable about its, you know, its form. Kids have a habit of wanting what their older brother and sister have, right. and they want this, the PSP. It brings together a whole load of technological platforms, wireless connectivity, a new format that can hold movies that's a little bit like DVD but smaller and, and relatively cheap. Um, you've also got uh, removable media so you can get your pictures from your camera. Essentially, it's the perfect example of convergent technology. And I just think it looks beautiful. It's got, it's got real character. What do you think? Well, actually, I'm, I'm not into gaming consoles particularly, but I want to buy one soon for my seven-year-old daughter, and I think I would buy her that one because it feels more responsive to use. It looks a lot better, and there's something, to me, actually, there's a slightly naff about that. There's nothing naff about our next nomination, the £10,000 Bang & Olufsen Beolab 5 speaker. You know how with most speakers, when you put them in different rooms, they sound completely different? Yeah. Well, these are the world's first speakers that actually adapt to the rooms that they're in. OK, how do they do that? First of all, the bass notes, they send out a test signal around the room, and they pick it up with a microphone that pops out the bottom. They analyse the signal, oh, and yeah, they uh, adapt the bass notes accordingly. The mid-range treble speakers are in these saucers here. They're mounted horizontally and the sound from those is thrown forward with these acoustic lenses. With those speakers, you have to sit in a fairly restricted range of position to get the perfect treble, whereas with this, it throws it out over a fairly wide zone. Uh, Almost uh, anything in front of the speakers. How, how wide? Well, theoretically, it's 180 degrees wide, but I think you, you'll notice a bit of difference, but it's much more even. I think they look very distinctive, and they're also a bit of a technological world first, so for me, that's what you need to be an icon. I agree, they're, all, they're ticking the right boxes, aren't they, for, yeah. you know, for what it takes to be remembered in 10, 20, 50 years. My only concern is that they're, they're quite niche. You know, what they do is very specialised, and to be fair, it's, it's quite expensive. Well, £10,000 is expensive, but there's, there's going to be 250 quid imitators in a year or two's time, and for me, it, it is an icon, but it's an icon in the way that a Rolls Royce is, rather than a, a, a Mini or an iPod. Our third and final contender is the Motorola V3, the thinnest mobile phone you can buy. It's incredibly stylish, but it's not 3G and the camera isn't very good. Maybe this is the start of phones that are just phones again, instead of having to be everything all together. Well, there's the point, because isn't it the case that lots of iconic things, whether they be gadgets or not, are remembered because they began something. And mm. if I agree with you, if this phone begins the move backwards to phones that are just phones mm. and not essentially multimedia players, mm. then uh, I reckon you know, that, it, that would seem to work. And it is a lovely feeling looking object. And I think that makes it potentially an icon for me. So which of these three is likely to be the next gadget icon? I think the phone is great, but it's not that different from other phones to really make it into that gadget hall of fame in 10 or 20 years' time. Mm. So it's all between the innovative but horribly exclusive Biolab and the much more popular, though arguably slightly less innovative, Sony PSP. What do you think? I think you're right. I think the Biolab 5 is just too exclusive. So for me, everyone is going to want to get their hands on one of these. They're going to be queuing around the block to get it. So for me, my gadget of choice, my icon, is the Sony PSP. OK, sold. Look at these poor souls. When they wanted to use a phone, they had to hold a huge lump of Bakelite to their ear. <laughs> Imagine still doing that today. Well, actually, you can stop imagining, because this is Nicholas Roop, and he's created a range of ridiculously retro handsets that plug into mobile phones. OK, 
I mean, what I've tried to do is just source kind of interesting handsets because there's a lot of really dodgy ones on the market. I mean, this is this is that's your field radio, isn't this it? Is your a world, radio. Circa World War One. Yeah. So this is basically the sort of thing you get from a second-hand shop. I mean, it's still got all the the wires in it and yeah. obviously the old technology. Yeah. yeah. Um, you'd replace the technology inside there? Would have to with this one, yeah. Because if you look at if you look at the the um, components, they're just really <laughs> wow. seriously old school. Well, what does that do? It's uh, it's from the Dark Ages. Nicholas replaces the worn-out innards from old handsets with the microphone and speaker from a hands-free kit and then wires in a plug that will fit most mobiles. Quite like that. Yeah, that's quite sort a classic. Sort of square, chunky sort American of style. Binatone circa 1992. This is an Indian handset. This is, we call this the uh, Jaipur Exchange. I'm thinking Convoy. Lovely. This one is the, uh, is the Stevenage. Um, oh, beautifully named. <laughs> Yes, Diane, I'm calling you on the Stevenage. When you put it here, you suddenly realise how awful these yeah, things yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. This is just not meant to be on your ear, yeah. especially my yeah. ears. Look at these great big flappers. Yeah. I mean, th this, actually, <laughs> this actually feels really comfortable. This is an Ericsson thing from probably the 20s, I think. It's an Ericsson? Yeah, that's an Ericsson. It's, 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 Fantastic. Um, Ericsson there, Stockholm, Sweden. Um, this is also an Ericsson from probably t you know, 10, 20 years after that. Uh, and then this is an Ericsson from, like, last year. Um, and to me, that yeah, that seems like a progression. Yeah. And then I don't know what happens here from a design point of view. That you know, this is working better than this for me. I just love the idea that, that you that, that you see the progression here and you accept it. But this is not a progression for you. For well, the rest of us, it's small and portable. But yeah, yeah. Uh, but for Nicholas, it, it's actually atrocious, isn't it? It upsets you, doesn't it? That. <laughs> Nicholas is now producing brand new retro style devices and is working on new designs incorporating Bluetooth technology. So now you can look disconnected even when you're not. Now for the final part in our review of the world's iconic gadgets. This time we're looking for the future heroes. Last week, Jason and I flew off to CBIT, the world's largest consumer electronics and IT show, to file this exclusive Gadget Show Video Diary report. Um, this place is vast. With over 6,000 exhibitors, any future gadget icons should be here. Let me show you something, OK? The first thing to catch our eye was this 7 megapixel camera phone with interchangeable lenses, a very fast shutter speed, manual focus and a proper flash. Just round the corner was another groundbreaking phone. You dial numbers by making their shape in the air. An accelerometer inside the phone measures the movement along three axes to identify each character. Three. Well, some of the time. No, I, no. I know. Oh no, what's that? Well, you've broken it. It's going to be some way before this becomes like Minority Report. However hard to get to grips with, a future using gestural interfaces will mean playing games without buttons and being able to change phone settings without trawling through menus. You'll be on a call, you'll want to send them your business card, it'll just be, yeah, one second. Yeah, did you get that? And then they'll go, yeah, I'll just put it in my folder. OK, do you get the idea? Three years after its debut at CBIT, Bluetooth is everywhere, with speakers, camcorders and this, the Sony Ericsson ROB1, a camera that you drive remotely from your mobile phone. It moves around on little wheels and can be operated up to 50 metres from the controller and streams all the picture information back to your phone via a Bluetooth connection. When it goes on sale in the autumn, the potential for mischief from this impressive little creature is immense. John also found another Bluetooth device, the prototype Runster. What we've got here is a novelty fitness aid. You've got an MP3 track in your phone. This is a movement sensor that'll go with it. And as you jog along, it uh, adapts the rhythm of the music exactly to the pace of your uh, training, which is uh, interesting. Here's a more serious mobile phone development, antivirus software. Experts are predicting that mobile ID theft, hijacking of your phone's internet connection, even mini-mobile spam could reach epidemic proportions by 2007. TVs were, as usual, everywhere. And, as usual, there were some very big ones. 
You'll remember that the world's biggest plasma screen is a 71-inch monster. Well, it was, because now there's this. 102 inches. It's seven foot too wide and four foot too high. And when it was unveiled, there was a flood of orders. But disappointingly, it's not in full production just yet. There's a chance it could be on sale in 2006. Price? Unconfirmed as yet. But as a guide, the mere 80 inch version comes in at 23 grand. The truth is, we never did find anything which had the feel of a future gadget icon. But we did find something that just might be iconic future technology. This is an LCD screen. It's Samsung's 5-inch TFT LCD screen, to be precise, which, despite its diminutive stature, has the potential to make a huge impact. Bendable screen there. We worked a little bit of gadget show magic. OK, we showed them our credentials and they got one out of the case. It actually bends in your hands, which I know isn't that impressive. Um, but when you think about what it means, it means curved surfaces. It means essentially a spherical television, uh, all kinds of clothing that you can wear with, uh, with screens that are very, very lightweight, roll-out screens, mobile phones with foldable screens. Generally, the most, one of the most significant things at the show, undoubtedly, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. most small vehicles, it's stable. This is because the back wheels tilt, not just a little, but a The awesome power of the Xbox 360 has rewritten the book on computer games design. 